All right, here we go again. It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show, recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, AADL.org, on the corner of 5th and Williams. I'm Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. Uh, I'm also from Ann Arbor. And with me today is a man with an enormous resume, a guy who's doing some super exciting stuff in comics, uh, Mr. Carl Altstatter. Hey. hey. Carl. How's it going? It's, uh, it's going well. So... Uh, <laughs> Whoa, what's going on? I'm recording an audio note in my Evernote by accident. All right, here we go. So, uh, Carl, man, uh, let's introduce you to the public at large and all the stuff you've done. Uh, you've been doing comics since when? Like uh, the 90s? Since about yeah. the same time I started with my dippy little mini comics, you were working in the big leagues. Uh, well, I guess you could call it the big leagues. I started out as an assistant to a couple different uh, artists that were working for Marvel. And uh, I kind of came up through the whole image thing, you know, working for the various studios and all that. Mm. Also worked for Marvel and DC on and off. And then I kind of got out of comics for a little bit. And I worked for the Disney Imagineer. So I worked for different toy companies. And then I decided, decided to publish my own comics. And that's when I did the comic book deity. And I created the company Hyperworks. And I did that for almost eight years. Wow. So, um, and then I got back involved in the toy industry, which the toy industry is, I must say, pretty lucrative. So yeah. <laughs> every once in a while, it's like you have to dip your foot back in that pool. But uh, yeah, so now I'm, I'm back into doing some of the comic stuff, which is, you know, it's always been my passion. That's the thing I really enjoy doing. It's funny how a lot of us have to subsidize our cartooning careers by working in advertising, television, and toy design. Which, you know, when you say toy, the toy industry and television industry, like doing storyboards for TV, people like, you know, people who don't know our careers all that well are like, wow, how glamorous. And you're like, well, it pays good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, I'm never going to uh, complain about getting a storyboarding gig. It's one of the most fun jobs in the world. But is it glamorous? I don't know if it's glamorous, I guess. But it's not the same as having a finished book in your hands that you produced yourself, right? Yeah, no. Definitely people have like a, what I call like a media hierarchy. If they think, if you say, well, you know, I did something for TV, that's one thing. If you say I did something for movies, that's even better. If you say, well, I created my own comic book, you may care more about that. But for them, they're like, tell me more about the TV gig. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. But yeah, we're way more excited about the comic books. So yeah. let's talk about the image days a little bit. Because yeah, it, it, you know, that was for those who weren't there at the time or for those who uh, maybe weren't paying attention at the time. It cannot be understated what an exciting time that was for comics like 1992, 93, 94, yeah. right? Yeah, no. Um, it's interesting to me because um, since I was, you know, really living through that, you know, I'll hear people talk about it. I've even seen, I've even read books that have been written about that time period. And, and I would say 90% of them are just not right. Like, oh, how so? Well, they talk about like events that never really happened, you know? Yeah. Like they'll say this particular meeting happened or, or something like that. And I'll read it and I'll be like, I was there and that didn't happen, you know? <laughs> and, and I think there's like a misunderstanding. I think uh, a lot of people think that these guys got together and, um, you know, decided we're going to do a specific thing. They didn't think it was going to be that successful. You mm -hmm. know, they didn't, they had no idea that it was going to be as big as it was. You know, they sort of captured lightning in a bottle with it. And I don't think they were necessarily prepared for it. But you think about all the people that came out of that, all the studios and stuff like that. I mean, it was a great time for giving a lot of different diverse artists a break. All those guys have gone into animation, video game design, film design, toy design. You know, they're all over the place. And a lot of them learned, got their start in art through that movement. You know. you know, yeah, it is a time that sometimes by some certain groups gets characterized as a time of uh, gluttony, excess, and uh, chasing after dollars. Um, when the thing I try to remind myself in dealing with anybody, both online and off, is that anybody who's doing a project of any kind, nine times out of ten, they're just in it for the creative part of it. They're just in it to make something. Yeah. And uh, yes, everybody wants to make a buck. Everybody wants to make a living. But uh, I always try to assume that anybody who's making something, whatever I think of the project, they're, they're putting their level best into it, right? Yeah. Regardless of whatever taste things come into it, you know? So, 
it, it, it's. I wonder if we're on the on the cusp of a bit of a uh, nostalgia renaissance of the '90s style. The '90s comics have gotten beat up a lot over the last, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. ten years. Well, it's funny because when I talk to other guys from that era, they um, they don't get the backlash. They don't understand it. They mm. they say to themselves like, um, the reason why people, you know, the average artist could make a lot of money is because more people were interested in the books. Yeah. And you can make an argument to say that, uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, and if you're reaching a mass audience of people, having these sort of over-the-top drawings, sort of people responded to that. And I know this is crazy, but in the same, in the same way that people like professional wrestling, it's the same kind of thing. You know, it's just they know it's not real. They know it's not you know, meat and potatoes, but they want their cotton candy and soda pop, you know what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's like the Transformers movies. I mean, those movies make a lot of money. Pirates of the Caribbean, that makes a lot of money. And uh, it's it's entertainment made for a broad audience. It's not blankets, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I love blankets. I, I think it's a great book. I mean, Optic Nerve, I, I like all those types of comics. But if you were probably to look at what those image books sold and how they hit such a broad audience, it was for a different group of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll still hear people at conventions, you know, they'll come up to me and they say, I wish comic books were like this again. And I don't necessarily wish comic books were like that. I wish there was some sort of middle ground, you know, more like I think how the comics were in the 80s, where yeah. some, you know, a good amount of story and a good amount of art and, you know, in equal doses. But you can't, you know, you can't discount the excitement that those comics brought. Well, that's, yeah, you're talking about yeah a little bit of everything, and yeah, talking about the '80s, that was uh, a, a really glorious time for diversity and experimentation. Yes, Marvel and DC still held all the cards back then, but you had uh, you know uh, Wendy and Richard Peeney doing their ElfQuest books, and, their, and then you yeah. had Mirage Studios. You had, I mean, at the very least, you had Marvel doing Epic's line, Epic Illustrated, yeah. and then the whole Epic line of books. What a time for discovering artists w back then, you know? I mean. And now we're, we're experiencing that again. We're experiencing this huge flourishing of different styles and genres and subject matter and, uh, and, and uh, coupled with critical acclaim, which is amazing. But yeah. sometimes I do think that we tend to, in uh, comics advocates, comics evangelists, whatever you want to call them, can be a little bit too severe in pushing towards the blankets, the Gemma Bovary's, as awesome as they are. Yeah, we should also have comics that speak to a broad audience too, because after all, we want everybody to read comics, right? And, yeah. Yeah. Well, part of it is, um, you know how uh, when people get out of high school, they get into college, and they don't want anyone to see their prom picture? Hmm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then they, they get to about 30, 35, and then they want to look at their prom picture. <laughs> I, I think image is definitely the prom picture. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what, what seems silly to you when you were in college, now you're so nostalgic for. Yeah. You go, that was such a great time in my life. I didn't even realize it. And I think that's what a lot of people are going through now. They're mm. looking back at that period of time. I mean, I'll have people come up to me, <laughs> grown men, and they'll be like, I read your comic book when I was 12 or 11 years old. And I'm like, Jesus, you're a grown man. I'm old. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, but, those people are, are getting a certain point in their life where they want to look back at that stuff and they appreciate it for what it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, you know, I'm a person who likes a lot of different types of comic books. So to me, for people to be so angry about one aspect of the comic industry or one era, that's like me saying, oh, Ditko drives me crazy. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, doesn't drive me crazy. I, I appreciate what he does. Think about for how many years people didn't understand Kirby. You yeah. Know? I, I remember in the 80s, people would say, you know, when I was a kid, I would go to a comic shop and people would say, his work is ugly, mm -hmm. you know? And now people, of course, understand it for what it is. It's great, great artwork. I'm not necessarily saying all that image stuff is going to be Kirby, but... You know, still, it's definitely... Well, no, you, you know what this reminds me of a little bit? And, and I hope you don't take this... I hope you take this in the spirit it's intended. Is that as a guy who really, really likes 1980s cartoons, okay? Like, yeah. you know, like I watch uh, Teddy, the Teddy Ruxpin show and I really like it. And, uh, and then people <laughs> and people say to me, like, oh, well, does it hold up? And I'm like, hold up to what? It was a show aimed at a very specific kind of audience. And no, it doesn't hold up if you try to compare it to, say... Uh, 
I don't know, some, some, some Criterion Collection movie. It's not meant for that audience. You have to w read it or view it in the spirit that it was intended. And there are such things as things that are just sweet, exuberant, not uh, guileless kind of material, and that's what its value is. And to say, oh, to hold it up to something that is meant for a very specific, different audience is unfair. And you can't sit, you can't ask if it holds up. So what I'm trying to say here is, is that there's a reason that that image explosion happened when it did. Yes, part of it was the speculator market that was going on at the time, but there was also a lot of crazy interest in comics at that time. And there must have been some reason that these stories were grabbing onto audiences, right? Uh, you know, a million, two million readers can't be entirely wrong. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's also, too, um, that, you know, people started, every every writer out there, every creator wanted to have their Dark Knight and their Watchmen. They wanted to have their adult, complex comic book. Yeah. Right? And you see this whole era of writing that came after the image stuff, and everybody's like, God, I want to be Grant Morrison. Yeah. You know, and, and that's great, but at the same time, in who makes comic books for kids anymore? And I'm not saying necessarily like children. I'm talking about the youth market. Yeah. How how do you you know the kids that read Harry Potter, the kids that read Naruto, the these kind of kids aren't being really serviced anymore because this sort of adult mentality has been brought to the comics. In some ways, like when you would when you'd see the people who would e even though the image comic books were kind of violent. They were sort of like what kids are into video games nowadays. If you look at something like Gears of War or you look at something like Halo, all that stuff's quite similar to what the image stuff was doing. Video games, in, in fact, reflects a lot of what the image art style was. And you can even see it, the over-the-top posing, the guns, the armor, the padding, the <laughs> all the craziness of that era. But you see it in all the video games. Master Chief has many pouches. He does. He has many pouches and he has quite a large gun. <laughs> so, uh, I think kids who uh, wanted that kind of, you know, uh, wrestling image comic stuff, they're all looking at video games now. Hmm. Well, I don't want I don't want to belabor this point anymore. I just wanted to quickly talk about you know like that that was a very special time and uh, and I do suspect that there's going to be some kind of. Uh, nostalgia renaissance of of those kinds of stories again. It'll be interesting interesting to see what a new take on it. Like seeing some of these young artists who grew up on this stuff, what they do yeah. with it. Um, but because we had a lot to talk about today, but I also want to finish introducing some other uh, projects that you've done. So you worked for Image. You worked on uh, Blood Strike. Uh, what were some of the other books you did for them? Um, well, I worked on an as, as an assistant on a lot of books. Oh, really? Which ones? Yeah, I worked on Wildcats. I worked on Cyberforce. Um, what what I is did some stuff on Wetworks? Wow. What, what what do you mean by assistant? What exactly did you do in that situation? Um, everything from background inks to holding linings to drawing backgrounds, things like that. Okay. Yeah, and before that, I'd worked for you know a group of artists, and I worked on as an assistant on X Men and all that stuff okay. leading up to the image the image stuff. So yeah. But then you went on to do your own stuff, so you did Deity. And what, yeah. was, what was Deity? Uh, Deity was a comic book that I created with Robert Napton. He actually, um, he's a writer and a creator, and he's actually, uh, he runs Bondi's manga division now. And um, he and I have been friends for years, and we've done a lot of comics during the Image era of stuff. Uh, he, he, we wrote Bloodstrike together, and then we decided to create our own idea. And so um, Deity was the book we created. And we, uh, it's interesting because that book, initially, I couldn't give it away. The first month I came out with it, like we, we'd been selling uh, at the time when we were doing Bloodstrike, we were like 75, 80,000. Oh, and I think the lowest we got was like 50,000. And so I thought, well, if I come out with my own comic book, maybe I'll sell half that, yeah. you know, quarter of that. The first copy sold fifteen hundred copies. Oh wow! Go, oh my God, face plant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 you know, but I kept going, and I figured, well, I'll just try to finish the story, and so it turned out the reorders were actually larger than the initial order. Hmm. So it came out, and it started selling well, and eventually we built it up to about twenty-five thousand at the height of it. 
That Which, is a different time. Yeah, that is a different time because by today's standards, that's an amazing amount of sales. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, that maybe, you know, yeah, it's a much different time now. But at, at that time, you know, we were rolling with it. And um, we did that for a couple years. And then we ended up uh, optioning the idea to film Roman, the people who make The Simpsons. Mm. And so we went through that with them. And uh, then they kind of had a change at the top. And uh, we got the rights back to it. And over the years, you know, I mean, there is not one convention that I go to where people don't say, you know, please bring back Deity, bring that comic back, bring it back. Because, you know, we did like five or six miniseries of it. So we had a good run of it. And, uh, you know, I, I see Robert all the time. You know, I meet up with him and, and we always go, well, should we do it? Should we make, should we bring it back? And then we go, eh. Let's have, some, let's have some lunch and we'll think about it. <laughs> well, is is the the book is still in print though, right? Is there a way for people to get it? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I mean, I have copies. I I bring them with me at shows, and um, I always sell a bunch of the trade paperbacks that I have. Uh, people who even um, collected the single issues, when they see me in person, they'll just hey, I need something signed, and they'll get the trade paperbacks. You know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dog ear that thought for future talk when we talk about digital comics in a little bit here, but keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. What are they going to sign? That's yeah. what I'm <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you, if you can, uh, if you have some sort of Wacom type thing, maybe you just, you know, sign. There was a, there was a story. Well, we, we could just diverge into that. There was a story recently about some author who was actually, oh, I don't know if it was the Kindle or the Nook, one of those digital e-readers. She was a, a prose author and she was actually digitally signing books with a stylus. Really? Which is interesting, but I'm not convinced that that is going to feel the same as having a special hardcover bound volume with a personalized, you know, thing in there to you. You know what I mean? Well, I know that's a big issue amongst the comic creators I know because part, you know, I think in some ways uh, the convention is becoming a more important venue for the comic creator than almost the comic store a little bit right now. Analogous yeah. to con uh, concerts for musicians, right? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely like touring. I know that when I started the Deity stuff, um, I started doing shows all over the country. And you notice that the stores that are around the convention you visited buy more of your comics. Because you go there and it's like, like a band, you know? You go in and you play a, a, an event and then those people go to the local stores and they want the stuff, you know, they want the comics. But, you know, my whole thing is when people meet you in person, they want something, a memento of that occasion. You know, they want to have something they can take home and say, I met this creative person and I can show people, hey, look, when I met him, he signed this and did a sketch for me. Yeah. If you bring up your iPad, unless you've got an engraving tool right there, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's going to be kind of difficult. Even though I, I have heard stories of like um, authors like William Gibson signing iPads and stuff, but that kind of makes sense for him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, William Gibson, big sci-fi author, right? That's right. like, yeah, that's like getting Bradbury to sign your iPad. That's that's a totally different thing altogether, you know. Yeah. So, but um, okay, but I want to I'm gonna keep talking about your creds real quick because you also did a series called Emerald City Blues, which yeah. was now was that that got some acclaim, right? Yeah, it did pretty well. It it's um it was really what I would call like a hobby comic to a certain extent. It was um uh. Another artist I know, his name is Jesse Tobis. He uh, he's a 3D animator and a comic book artist. He actually worked on uh, Sam the Samurai comic as well. He uh, challenged me to do the 24-hour comic, uh, you know, the the yearly 24-hour comic thing. And I was like, um, I don't want to do that if I'm not getting paid to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but he, you know, he he uh, he really challenged me with it, and I thought, well, I'll give it a try. So I went down there, and there was like. I'd say 40, 50 people, like grandmothers, kids, hardcore comic people. And then there's like a whole subset of people that are just into 24-hour things. You mm -hmm. know about this? They make 24-hour movies. They do 24-hour clothing. I mean, <laughs> they'll do anything that they can make in 24 hours to make it. Yeah. So um, I got there, and, and my understanding of it was you just get there, and you think up the idea right there, and you do it. And the only idea I had going into the 24-hour thing was – I'll do, I was thinking I'll do my take on some sort of fairy tale, I thought. And I didn't know what it was going to be. And then I just sat down there and I first thing that popped out of my head was The Wizard of Oz. I just started drawing it. And I lasted about 17 hours. 
and um, I inked, I drew 17 pages and I inked 11 of them. So then I went home and I just drank like a Red Bull. <laughs> so I started lettering them, started scanning them and lettering them. And then I decided to post them because I thought, well, maybe this might be a chance for me to do a web comic type thing. I thought, you know, it might be a good way to, to start that. So I started putting it up and people, whoa, I lost my uh, screen there. <laughs> um, and people uh, seemed to like it, so I kept going with it. And then I started doing print-on-demand with it and bringing them to shows. And um, I've gone back and forth with the print-on-demand stuff a few times. And I sell through them every time I go out to shows. So I thought of putting it out uh, in the direct market as maybe as a full graphic novel. But in some ways, I kind of like it just being something that's available for people online. And it's such a strange thing for me, too, because pretty much people can read it for free. I mean, they don't, there's no, I'm not stopping them from having access to it. They can go on any time and read it. And yet they read it. And then when they see me in person, they buy it from me, which was a big change for me. Yeah. I, I, I had no idea that that kind of thing really worked. And it, and it does to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, people don't just take the work and go, thanks, sucker, <laughs> and run away. Well, some do. <laughs> well, some do, but, but you know, this is something I've said a million times. It's like people do that at conventions. People come up and they read through the whole darn book and they put it down and they say thank you and they walk away. You know, I mean, that, you, you can't stop that. I mean, it's just the convention is a more limited experience in terms of who gets to read the entire book. But at least somebody read it and is familiar with it. And if they had a, a funny, th you know, it's like, okay, this is something I think about in, in teaching. It's like a, a really smart teacher friend of mine once told me, it was because I was teaching a class of teenagers for the first time, and you know, teenagers always very like protective of their egos, and they don't want to reveal too much right. about themselves and all that stuff. And so I'm doing my thing, where I'm doing my Kermit the Frog arms, I'm getting all excited about comics, and they're all like this. And I, and I and I said to my teaching friend, I'm like, why do they hate me? You know, why do these kids hate me so much? And she said, you know, you don't know what thing you said is going to stick with these kids for the rest of their lives. You have to touch base with these kids weeks, months, years after the class to find out what took. And sure enough, I've had students who are teenagers who come to me years later and say, and repeat something that I apparently said to them at one point, you know, they're like, oh, it's like you told me once, you know? And at the time they were all like, oh, everything's lame, I'm a teenager. But then, you know, they come back and they're suddenly enlightened by this, this, this thought that apparently I said. And it's the same thing with people reading your stuff online, in my mind anyway, or reading it at a show is like, you don't know what jumped out at them that they didn't reveal to you. And then like months later, they're gonna come back and go, yeah, I remember I read this thing. This guy wrote this really funny thing. I'm gonna look him up online. Hey, he's got a book for sale. You don't know how many sales you make from that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Well, you know, for me, it's, it's similar to, um, you know, we were talking about the whole thing of touring and going to, to shows and being similar to a band. I know um, a couple years back when Radiohead, the, the band Radiohead, made their CD available and you could, or not their CD, but a digital download of their latest album and you could just pick the price, I paid what I would pay like nine ninety nine on iTunes because I want them to make more music. Yeah. So, uh, and I just love what they do. So it never even occurred to me to not pay the full price for it because I appreciate what they do creatively. And I, and I think that's what's going on with with me for Emerald City Blues, and I know it's going on with a lot of other people. But for me, there's something um, exciting about being able to just let the artwork and story be free to people. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have you don't have to be pitching it. You don't have to sell it. There's something liberating about that for me personally. I love having that up there and just saying, "Hey, you want to read it? Go ahead." You know, if you want to come back and make a quote unquote donation to what I'm doing, fantastic. And if you don't, that's okay too. And that, that part of it for me as a creator is really liberating. I think that's why I've enjoyed the project so much is because there's not something in the back of my mind like, oh, I need to be pitching this and creating it, pitching it and creating it. I don't mind pitching, but at the same time, having that out of the equation, it's cool. It's, yeah. It's liberating. It's a cool, cool thing. So you post a lot of stuff on DeviantArt too. Yeah. So what, what's your DeviantArt address for those for any young people watching or listening who might want to follow up and look it's at your stuff? It's uh, Comic Carl with a K, so K O M I C K A R L, uh, and you can just search for me on DeviantArt. And uh, yeah, I've been pretty active in DeviantArt for a while. I think it's a, a an interesting. You know, I I had never been a person who was on MySpace. I, that never really appealed to me, and I still like Facebook if I didn't have family that was on it. 
I don't know if I would even be on Facebook. Yeah. But for some reason, DeviantArt just, of course, you know, it's the creative side of it that appealed to me. And it, and the only two that have ever stuck for me is that and Twitter. Yeah. I like Twitter a lot. Because you, you can sort of just jump in and jump out. That's it's like true. a weird timeline commenting thing, you know, so that, that appeals to me. And, and I like people can't write a novel. They can <laughs> write like a couple sentences. That's true. That's true. And and, and you, can, uh, you can just jump in and get involved in a conversation or you can jump in and co throw a quick plug of look at the thing I did and it's pretty flexible in terms of what people expect of it so yeah it's pretty neat that way yeah my only concern is that it's shifting more towards if you don't have something snarky to say like <laughs> people won't say anything yeah yeah I mean it the, we, we could go into a whole subsect of that about you know, like some of the people who just go on the internet and say this is the thing that I think is dumb and this is why uh, this is lame. Here's here's the lame thing I found today, you know. And yeah, and sometimes uh, I do feel like if I post a isn't this neat post that I'm going to get uh, laughed out of the room, you know, because you, you're encountering so much snark sometimes. Yeah, but, they'll, they'll say that Jersey. He's so naive. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do get that. I'm looking at you, Alice Hunt, if you're listening. Al, uh, <laughs> hey, kids, comics. Uh, she was on a past episode. Man, she gives me a hard time on there, but uh, but I love her just the same. Anyway, uh, I want to talk about one more thing that is very exciting, uh, and I don't know why you do this to yourself, Carl, but uh, you started an anthology, Samurai the Graphic Novel. Uh, it's samuraigraphicnovel.blogspot.com is where people can find it. Yeah. And this is a collection of uh, themed comics that follow a samurai theme. And you've got some really talented people in here, like Jamie Gamble, Jeremy Burley. Uh, who else is in here? Drew Johnson. Drew Johnson. Holy cow. Yeah, I did a fantastic cover for it. Um, you know, I, they, I've sort of developed a, a, or been a part of a group here in L.A. of, of different comic book artists. And I kept thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we worked on something together? and sort of really celebrated diversity in a comic book. And so I thought of this idea, what's your take on a samurai? And so we all got together and I always uh, bring this up and get a laugh out of the, the group when I say that everybody did a Kurosawa story. <laughs> it was the same story, you know, the guy comes to town, wants revenge, you know, but they added one other thing, but with ghosts or but with an, in a Western, but you know, so I said, hey, we need to go back and maybe try a little bit harder and come up with something a little bit different. So they went back and they came back with some really interesting concepts and interesting ideas. So we worked really hard and put it together. And it's a, you can actually, um, it's available online. You can buy it online. And uh, we also sell them at shows. And so we all sort of, a, I guess you'd say what I call a co-op comic, where we all sort of participate in the uh, the proceeds from it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So everybody pays in as well as contributes to it. So sort of... mm -hmm. everybody didn't pay in. Uh, myself and one other person uh, paid into the uh, getting it printed. And so once that money comes out of it, which we've actually made some money off it so far, uh, then whatever's over that then we're going to separate equally between the creators. Okay. But I'm also thinking about uh, maybe doing something where I, you know, a lot of them do conventions, and I know that they've done pretty well with selling the comic book while they're there, so I've been thinking about giving out part of the inventory to them and just allowing them to do with it what they will. As Keep part the proceeds of from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think that's cool. I mean, that, that that's, you know, in, in a world where the word spec work becomes... Uh, increasingly more frowned upon this is the kind of spec model where if you treat it like a co-op that makes more sense right because you're not doing spec for some corporation you're doing spec for everybody involved it's it's uh, a collaborative effort so th this is very similar to the thing that I did and hope to get back to again sugary cereals which was you know another anthology series now I want to ask you why do an anthology people seem to think uh, in a general sense uh, most people I talk to seem to think that anthologies just won't sell in book markets or in comic markets well, um, I think anthologies are, are a tough sell, but I think they're not as tough of a sell to people outside of comic books. And I think with this project in particular, it was about taking people who aren't necessarily uh, comic book artists all the time and having them create.
create a comic book. And it wasn't like I said, we should do a comic book called Superhero and everybody does their take on Superhero. We chose something that um, anybody who's ever seen a samurai movie or even a Western could probably get their head around. And um, I worked the numbers and I realized that our break even point was actually fairly low. Mm -hmm. So I thought this would be a great um, artistic project for everybody, but also something that as these uh, artists went out into their normal circles, whether it be gallery showings or conventions or, or what have you, they would have something that they could sell or show to people that was a cool art object, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really see it as an anthology that would have to live or die in the direct market or, or something along those lines. I just thought it would be a great art piece that we could sell as individuals. So that was sort of the approach on it, which I think is a little different. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you're going to a gallery showing and you say, hey, this is this cool thing, I mean, some people aren't into superheroes, but they may think, hey, a samurai, I understand that, let me give that a try. I mean, some people have bought it just because they dig the idea of samurais. They're, they're into the idea of it. Yeah. So I thought it was a good way to reach out to a different group of people. I think you're right. I think you're right. And, and you know, as, as somebody who reads a lot of comics, uh, I, I never understood people's uh, reticence to check out anthologies because when I was a kid in, in my, you know, like 12 years old, 13 years old, that was when I discovered Epic Illustrated. You remember that magazine? Right. Which was like sort of like Marvel's version of heavy metal, but it was like a little bit cleaned up, wasn't quite as uh, sexy as heavy metal was. Although yeah. there were some, some fantastic things. art in it, though. Oh my God. That, I mean, that's when I discovered Ken Stacy. That's, uh, oh, I'm trying to think who Barry else. Barry Windsor Smith is in it. Barry Windsor Smith, uh, Charles Bass. A lot of Kaluta covers. But yeah, and I just remember just it, my brain was set on fire with what comics could be when I was 12 and 13 years old because when at that time, this is in like the mid 80s, you know, comics were still four color offset printing, like that process printing with the, the what are those dots called? Band-Aid dots or whatever. Yeah, right. Huh? And, uh, and so you, you didn't see like a lot of lit, rich, lavish coloring back then to, to, see, to see pencil and pastel comics, uh, just graphite pencil comics. It was, it was mind-blowing. And then plus it was just neat to see in one volume so many different styles, so many different takes on ideas rather than the, the fully packaged single artist, single writer kind of thing. So... I don't know, it always confuses me when people say, like, oh, nobody likes anthologies. I'm like, why? It's, like, the most exciting thing in the world to flip through an anthology and see so many different kinds of stories, you know? Well, if you think of, like, what is one of the biggest comic books or big, or, or as the largest print run is Shonen Jump, which yeah. is essentially an anthology, you know? I think people – I think it's tough when you do an anthology that has to work in, in the direct market against superhero comics. But you look at something like Dark Horse Presents, you know, or Flight. Mm, Flight, one. good example. So, um, there's a lot of stuff that has been successful. That's but true. I, when I first brought the project up to everybody, I said, I kind of, I'm hoping that we can do sort of an indie heavy metal or uh, or aspire to, to something like Flight. That was definitely where we were coming from as a in terms of a project. And, uh, you know, for me, it's it's something where... People say it can't happen until it happens. That's true. So I figured if we came at it with the, you know, the intent to do something really good, it would work. And I mean, I think when people pick up the book, it sort of speaks for itself. You know, sometimes people will open up and they'll say, oh, they'll look at one story and they'll be like, well, maybe that's not my cup of tea. But then they'll find another story and they'll be like, oh, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. And you're hoping that, you know, I mean, there were times when I picked up heavy metal and I'd be like, oh, great, a Mobius story, you know? And yeah. <laughs> You'd read another story and you'd be like, meh, that's not my cup of tea. But that's what's the cool thing about it. You're being exposed to a lot of different things, you know. Yeah. So that was the, the premise behind it. So, okay, so people should go to samuraigraphicnovel.blogspot.com now with the time we have left. Because, I mean, gosh, it's clear to me that we could spend probably three hours doing this show with all the stuff we could talk about. Right. Uh, <laughs> But but we we got to get to talking about Me Too and your work with MTV because this leads into this whole idea about the future of comics and digital comics because you're doing some right. very interesting stuff with them. But first, let's talk about what Me Too is. Uh, well, Me Too is a project that I'm working on um, with MTV as part of their website, MTV Geek. And MTV Geek is kind of like a uh, a hub for everything that, I guess one would call geeky, but I think it's cool, which is basically video games, comic books, 
anime, toys, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I spoke with Tom Akel, who runs MTV Geek, and he was telling me that they wanted to do original comic book content for the site. And uh, so I had a couple ideas that I'd been thinking about for a while. So I pitched him, and he really liked the idea, and so I started creating it. And uh, basically, the, the premise of Me Too, it's about a girl who has multiple personalities, and each one of her personalities has a different superpower. But that's not ultimately what the story's about. As it gets deeper into it, you find out more about um, what happens when these personalities have been able to sort of escape. Mm -hmm. And we find out that they're not so much personalities, but maybe they're something else. So that's the mystery. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now there uh, there are some interviews with you on MTV.com. Uh, I'll put links in the show notes to these. Okay. But uh, you talk a little bit about how, and what I was delighted to hear is you were talking about the superhero kind of story. It's not sort of super. It's playing with the tropes of superheroes, but as a metaphor for coming of age, growing up, playing with the the, the struggles of adulthood before. You know, it, it, it through like analogy through this story, right? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, I I sort of thought about how uh, when I was a teenager or people I knew when I was a teenager, how they sort of you, you're struggling to find out your personality, you're struggling to find out who you're going to be as an adult. So um, you'll see uh, when you're in high school, though, someone will be one way and they'll go away for the summer and then they'll come back after the summer and suddenly they're a different style of dressing, a different their hair is different, they're doing a whole different thing. And then you see them five years later in college and they're a different, totally different person. And then you see them later on in life and they're completely different, you know? So I thought that would be an interesting time to explore for a character is to see who am I really gonna be? but to, to take that out in a physical sense. So mm -hmm. as you see different personalities emerge, these are different ways that she might, they're like sort of the extremes of her personality. So I thought that would be a different way of telling that type of story and, and sort of bring it out on a psychological level, like, bring, like physically manifested in the story. Right, so right. That's and the kind of idea I'm playing with. Yeah, and it's a metaphor for trying on the different identities that you try yeah. on when you're going through that, figuring out who the heck you are that you hopefully figure out by the time you're 25. But some people yeah. don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my whole thing with it, too, is um, she is sort of, it's it also is a metaphor for the internal struggle people have because some of her personalities are adversarial to her. Mm -hmm. And so it's the, the internal struggle we all deal with at almost any time in our life, but especially when we're teenagers, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a nice way of putting it. That's a much more uh, generous way of putting it <laughs> where I was going. But okay, so let's, let's talk about this. This is going to be a digital comic. Uh, hey, Carl, so what? There's tons of digital comics. Why not just put this on your own site? Why go to MTV? Why, how, what are you planning to do that's different? Uh, and, and how does this plug into your ideas about where the medium can go when we start doing comics? Because one of the things you talked about in, the, in those interviews on MTV.com was being able to click on a character's name and having it go to you know, uh, a bio about the character or every appearance they've ever had, like sort of like who's who or um, the guide to the Marvel Universe, but in wiki form. But a comics yeah. wiki, I think is what you called it, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, um, well, it's ex exciting working with the people at MTV because they have a broad idea of what comic books can be. And uh, especially working with Tom Akel and uh, Bradley Hatfield, those guys really understand. Well, they just have a broader idea of what you can do with comics. And that, to me, is exciting as a creator. And that's what I was talking about in that video clip, which is something that I've thought about for a long time, which is to... You know, I, I give this example, like when you watch Pulp Fiction, you uh, could tell that story as a linear story if you re-edited the movie. Uh, but the way it's told, the way you uh, get the information gives you a different emotional reaction. And so I remember when I was a kid and I would read a comic book, say you were reading the Fantastic Four and Dr. Doom would show up and he goes, do you remember the last time I was here? I blew up the Baxter building. And then there'd be a little thing at the bottom that would say, that was an issue number four, editor. You know? Right, right. And um, when I was a kid, I remember thinking, oh, I wish I had that issue laying right next to me because I'd like to see exactly what happened. Yeah. Now imagine you as a reader 
you're reading a comic book and it talks about an event, why not just literally you edit the comic book, you you edit the, the narrative, and you could hop around and basically create a flashback in the midst of a story if you wanted. So you say, I'm just going to hop back, and with, with a digital comic book, you could do something like that. You could have an issue and just literally takes you to the beginning of that scene, you read that scene, and then you jump back to the story. I think that kind of stuff of putting the uh, narrative in the hands of the uh, reader is an interesting way to go. Somewhat similar to what you see in video games, not changing how the comic book is necessarily presented, but changing how the person interacts with the material. That seems exciting to me. You know, I remember reading an interview with some of the designers of the Metroid game series. I think it was like Metroid Prime 1 or 2, whichever one. And they were saying that when we write that game, we write it in a linear fashion. This is the series of events that Samus Aran has to go through in order to yeah. get to the end. So, but then we write all these choices branching off of that and alternate routes to that end. So there's one way to go through that we build, but then we build around it this network of alternate routes. And it's not choose your own adventure. It's more akin to a story representing more like real life of like, here's the path you can go, but you have these alternate routes you can take. You set out at the beginning, I want to be a comics artist. Well, how are you going to get there? You're going to do indie comics, you're going to do underground comics, you're going to try to get a job at the publishers. There's a million choices and you can find right. your own route to that. So it, it, it was when I read that interview and then when the iPad came out, I was like, ding, 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 ding we cartoonists need to be looking at what video game writers do to really understand where we can go with this. Not just uh, silly, uh, gimmicky, choose-your-own-adventure kind of stuff, but really think about how we can make stories more web-like. It seems like that, that, that is upon us, that we should be really at least considering that in approaching storytelling on the web. So it's not just, oh, it's like a print comic, but not quite as good, you know what I mean? Right. You know, I'm, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. You know, I sort of look at it like, Imagine if you took the entire, you go into a comic store and you know they have the back issue bins, right? And you see mm -hmm. like the entire run of X-Men. And imagine if you were to put that in a digital database and you could access any aspect of the X-Men story. Instead of looking at it as a single issue, look at it as an entire universe, an entire world that you could jump to any point at. But what I'm saying as a creator to originate that kind of world. so. As you complete an issue, it just becomes part of the overall database. It just flows into the world that you have available for the reader. So as you create content and you get X amount of issues into it, you can literally, that becomes, it just broadens the entire experience. Because I've noticed something when I was doing Emerald City Blues where people would, uh, because it was on DeviantArt, I, would ha I had links to, they could jump from story to story. So if I reference something, people would tell me, um, I read page five, and then I jumped to page seven of the second issue, because they wanted to see it immediately. They yeah. wanted to control how they experienced the story. And that's what really got me thinking about it. I started thinking, this is just a, a pool that people get, get content from. It's not just, you know, because so much of what comic books have been because of the monthly schedule and putting them out in the in the quote unquote the pamphlet style, it's always about ending the story and making them come back for the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, so everything builds towards a cliffhanger, or is in some cases it's linked to some sort of crossover or something like that. But what I'm saying is, if you look at it as the whole story as one big piece versus looking at it as one single individual piece at a time, you can start to overlap ideas in a different way and give people access to those ideas and that's what I think is exciting so it's like you're saying like the video games so sort of pre-planning it and creating a, a tree that says well here this happened here this happened there and allowing people to jump from point to point that seems like a new way of telling you know not changing necessarily the panel to panel right kind of, you know I'm not saying necessarily to turn it into a motion comics motion oh, comics oh <laughs> Yeah. Are you are you doing that to press my buttons? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, um, I I'm not into the whole motion comics thing myself. You know, I I think it's a I think it's a really interesting medium. I just wish we didn't call it motion comics. I wish we'd come up with a name that was more descriptive because it, it confuses what comics really are. I, yeah. I mean, I, I think what well, everything we're talking about is is absolutely fascinating and and worthy of exploration, providing 
we stick with what makes comics great, and that is static images and sequence, right? And and right. artists who can create images that are static that look like they're moving, but they don't need to go that extra step to make it move because they're so good, you know? This is why Kirby's great. His characters look like they're moving, uh, even though they're not, you know? So anyway. Yeah, I mean, the way I sort of see it with, with this idea of jumping around from story to story, I don't really see it as story as much as it is moments. You know, mm -hmm. if you were if you were thinking about uh, a character when they had it, maybe a breakup or something, you could jump and experience the breakup as the author intended it to be experienced. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then jump back versus being able to. Well, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna remix this. You know what I mean? Oh, interesting, interesting. So that'd be like an answer to remixing by providing every conceivable option for your story, building the world in its entirety for a reader. Uh, right. Not that I'm against remixing. I think remixing is pretty interesting and really cool. It's like it's like this whole culture of everybody participating in a medium, and uh, but as we were talking about last week with Paul Story, uh, not every author is is keen on the idea of of people taking liberties with their work. And this leads me to another question. What we're, as we talk about this, is what does this mean? This kind of letting the audience decide the path. What does that do to the author's intent and the author's integrity? Doesn't that diminish a little bit of the author's voice by, by allowing the reader to decide which direction or which, which place they start? Yeah, I think with certain authors, it definitely could because they're sort of painting with, with the story and with the images, with the words. They're sort of painting a mood that is a, a they almost want you to be immersed in what's going on. But I think you could also do a style of comic book that has, like I said earlier, like moments. And it's about experiencing those moments as the characters, as you want to experience them. And the mood comes from the reader into the material versus from the material into the reader. So there's a different way of maybe experiencing it. I mean, I know with certain books, that probably wouldn't work as well. But I think you, you could create an experience from the ground level that made great use of that. So like in other words, like to kill a mockingbird might not work with a game style writing. Right? <laughs> right. You know, like like some pieces of non genre fiction probably demand like sort of like the author's voice kind of being in control to lead you to all of the metaphors and ideas and you know, complementary ideas and whatnot. But then there is more of a opportunity for a mass market. Going back to what we were talking about earlier about image comics, image comics were for a broad, broad audience. Maybe th this is an opportunity for comics to reach a broad, broad audience by playing on that kind of game theory of storytelling, right? Not gamification, not like, oh, I got a badge because I turned it to page 13, but uh, but more right. of like that kind of like that, that networky kind of path of storytelling. Uh, you know, it, I didn't even think about the concept of backstory for characters. I always have used the example of uh, two characters walk out of the book and they are not needed anymore for the main body of the narrative. But if you, the reader, decide that I, those guys are worth following, I want to see more of that, uh, you could create a parallel sort of uh, narrative that they could just follow by tapping on a certain part of the panel or whatever, and now it takes you to a new page. This idea of pages being more indexed like a wiki rather than as a, a uh, linear sequence of pages, right? Yeah. So... That, that, that stuff is fascinating. Now, what do you think about mobile devices? Because something that I'm thinking as I gear up, well, gear up, as I'm laying out plans for what I want to do with the Sugary Cereals anthology in years to come, is I'm thinking, gosh, I need to just make the web presence so much less important and make this thing more of a device comic, a comic sort of optimized for iPod touches. Because if there's one thing I see kids consuming content on more than anything else, it's iPod touches or something similar to it. Um, what What are your thoughts on on getting comics onto digital devices? Well, it's interesting because I, I had a conversation um, with the guys who uh, they created the app Whamix. Have you heard of that? I I did last night, thanks to you. <laughs> yeah. um, Whamix.com, right? Yeah, and you can download the app. Uh, actually, has one of my comic books in it already, and they have an interesting approach to the. Um, to interacting with the pages that's a little bit different than what you may see in Comixology or even on the Dark Horse app. You, you sort of jump from panel to panel and you can set it in a comic book mode or you can set it in what they call a storybook mode. So you can literally go from panel to panel to panel to panel and experience it one panel at a time. 
versus experiencing it as a single page. Mm -hmm. And when you experience it as a single page and you press on the panel, you know, you literally press on the screen, the panel pops out of the page, but it just pushes the color of the rest of the page back slightly. So in the same way that we naturally read a comic book and we focus on a particular panel and, and sort of uh, instinctually block out the rest of the page, it does that, but the artwork is still there to give you a bit of geography for the panel. Okay. You're still experiencing the context of the panel as it was meant to be experienced on the page, but you're focusing on it. And I thought that was an interesting um, way of using a digital device to naturally go with how you experience a comic. And that's why I think they're doing some interesting stuff. So that to me, that is, that is a way that it could actually maybe improve how you experience a comic. Interesting. And that's exciting to me. Yeah, because one of the things that I, I was using the Comixology app on my iPhone and uh... – I I, rem I remember just being shocked by the fact that, yeah, granted, an iPhone screen, it, unless you make a comic optimized for that screen, it's really tough to take a traditionally sized comic and map it to that screen. So their answer of going panel by panel where, like, they black out everything else and you just see that panel and then when you tap it, it swings around to the other panel. Yeah. I remember just thinking, like, ooh, I got a real problem with this because you're not seeing the panels in the context of the page anymore. And, and that kind of diminishes the whole idea of it being a comic. Now I'm just looking at a series of pictures. And yes, there's still a narrative, but I really had, uh, I got itchy about the iPhone presentation. Now the iPad presentation where you can look at a page view, comics look gorgeous on the iPad, absolutely yeah. gorgeous. And the Comicsology app on the iPad, I was like, this is terrific. But um, this idea of, Focusing on a panel while still seeing it in the context of the page is something that seems a little bit more palatable to me, at least. You know, I just I get really uh, edgy about removing panels from pages. But again, you know, it's like it just seems like for small mobile devices, there needs to be comics made specifically for those that aspect ratio and that resolution, right? Whereas I, I just don't. I, I think yeah. there's a lot of trouble with mapping traditional comics onto iPhones and iPod touches. Yeah, no, um, I mean, I've tried to read stuff on an iPhone, but to me, that, that's when, when I, I had an iPhone before I had an iPad, and when I look at the iPhone and look at a comic book on it, I just thought to myself, this just doesn't make sense. It's like you're shoehorning a style of media into this that doesn't work. Um, but I never watch movies on my iPhone either, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, when I saw uh, the iPad, and I remember when I put my first, I, I went on DeviantArt at the Apple Store, and I brought up one of my pages, and I saw it on there, and I go, oh, man, this <laughs> looks really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, at that point, that's when I, I go, wow, they've, they've done the, 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 the killer piece of consumer product that is going to allow for this now. And that was for years what was the problem for me. I always said, you know, there's, you know, print's never going to go out because it's portable. It's, um, you know, you can interact with it. You can zoom in and zoom out. And, you know, if you have this big computer and so forth, I was one of those people. But once I saw how it worked on an iPad, it just makes, in some ways, it makes more sense, you know, which is, I can't even believe I'm saying that. But, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I don't think that, th see, this is a question that comes up a lot, is that they say, well, this this means the doom of books. And I said, no, I don't think it means the doom of books. I mean, I just was watching Star Trek Next Generation, because it's on Netflix <laughs> now, and they show Jean-Luc Picard reading a book. There's our proof, 23rd, 24th century, right, right. They're, they're still reading books. But uh, So if that doesn't make you believe, I don't know what will. But but anyway, what, <laughs> for, for real, what I'm saying is, is that the only thing that's in danger is magazines and the monthly comic. Those are in danger, yes, but... Uh, if you can monetize digital monthly comics in some way through a thing like Comixology, like Whamix, uh, what other ones out, are out there? Um, Graphic.loi, yeah, uh -huh. IllustratedSection.com, or TheIllustratedSection.com. There's tons of services popping up like this. Um, then collect the book afterwards. You were saying earlier you gave away uh, Emerald City Blues and people still bought it, right? Yeah. You know, okay, so if people are, get, are consuming the stuff on their device, if they love it, they're going to buy it. We're consumers and we will consume. And so it just means, yes, maybe you won't sell 2 million copies. Maybe you'll sell 25,000, 
10,000 copies, but they're going into the hands of people who really, really love the work. And as long as you can make some kind of monetization on the digital editions that you're that you're distributing, you know, 99 cents or whatever, right. uh, then I don't see that as being a, a doom scenario. I see that as just being a transfer to a whole new model. And I'm actually delighted by the prospect of comics actually being affordable for kids again, you yeah. know? And that, I think that's a big one for me is that when I look at a five dollar, four dollar price tag on a comic, when I have to charge four fifty for a comic, I'm like, Ugh, I don't feel good about asking a kid for four fifty for this. You know? Yeah, if it was a two dollar comic book, or you know, I mean, think about back in the day, you had seventy five cent comic books or a dollar comic book. I mean, you could come up with that kind of change by looking through the couch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, I think a couple things are going to happen. I think you're seeing a lot of different. Um, iPad-like devices that are going to come out from a lot of different companies. And I think as the iPad goes up generation-wise, <clears throat> you know, when you're seeing like iPad 3 or iPad 4, iPad 1s are going to be dropping down into the 150, uh, you know, the Nintendo Wii kind of price range, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think you're, the, those, uh, they're going to have be, there's going to be more access to iPad-like devices. That's going to be one thing. But I think where print is going to evolve is that if you've seen like these things like Absolute Editions or just the other day I went to a used bookstore and I bought a Norman Rockwell copy sized, copy table sized book. It was a gigantic book and you could see his gigantic pieces of artwork and look at the detail. Mm -hmm. That's something where I think print will always be successful at. Absolutely. No yeah, question. That's sort of a, an, an art. Um, uh, what they call an art artifact, you know what I mean? It's something where you can literally put it in your house and it's like in the same way that people come up to a statue or a little tiny thing, you, a knickknack you may have in your house, they'll look at that book and they'll be like, oh, this is something special to look at. Yeah. You know? But in terms of reading stuff on a regular basis, like you're talking about um, magazines or monthly comic books, someone will just say, well, I can read that on an iPad, especially when it's cheaper and I don't have to put it in a box. I but, don't have to put it in a box. Man, you know, as a guy who has a long box or two, and I'll think about, oh, you know, I might want to go back and look at some of those amethysts again that I have, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, taking it out of the bag, putting it, you know, and then I then I take them all out of the bags, and they sit in a pile next to my bed for weeks, and then my wife gives me a hard time, you know, put them back in their bags and boards. Ugh, it's such a pain in the butt. I'd rather just have it be like my how my CD collection is now on my iPod, you know? Yeah, and so. I, think, I think that would be, like, for example, um, the other, I noticed they released this... Um, Walt Simonson Thor Omnibus mm -hmm. and I wanted to get it but I thought to myself if they had it for the iPad that would be even better mm -hmm. because I could just read it wherever I was at and anytime I wanted to look at those great Thor issues I could just have access to them you know um, for me that's fine I don't need like an oversized version of that but I think uh, that's what we're seeing a lot with with the the comic publishers they're going to start moving more towards digital, and I think comic book stores are going to be moving more towards specialty items, you know, like the Absolute Editions and art books and, and stuff like that. And, you know, you talked about that podcast where you talked about where comic book stores are going. If they can become like a meeting place, if they can become a place where people can learn about new stuff, then they could definitely survive in that incarnation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you're referring to episode 12 of Comics Are Great, where I was talking with Barry Gregory and Eli Nyberger. Uh, Calling All LCSs was the title of that one. Uh, but, uh, okay, so let's go back to Me Too just for a second, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up and we'll head over the calendar segment. Uh, so can you give one hint of one of the cool things that you're going to be doing with Me Too in terms of digital distribution on uh, MTV? Well, it's, yeah, it's going to be appearing for free on MTV Geek, and I'm hoping it's going to be out... Uh, very soon after San Diego Comic Con, which is later this month, and um, then it's also going to be available through Comixology. Oh, cool. So you're going to be able to go on their app and download it for your iPad and experience it and all this digital glory. <laughs> <laughs> and and people can find out updates about me too uh, by following you on Twitter, right? Is that when your yeah. your main news outlet? Yeah, and also um, following MTV Geek on Facebook and Twitter, and they uh, they sometimes mention the stuff as well as retweet some of my stuff. So you can also go on, check MTV Geek uh, all the time. I mean, they've got a lot of great news and features and interviews with a, a variety of creative people. Yeah, but, that's right. There's I, other comics on there besides yours too, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff on there. A lot of different people. Cool. So Comic Carl on the Twitters with the K yes. K O M I C K A R L. All right, so I am going to hit the stinger to uh, introduce our special ADL guest. Um, oh, if I can find my stinger. How do I do that? Oh, there we go. So now we're heading over to the calendar real quick. And that there's the signal. So with us is Sharon Iverson of the Ann Arbor District Library. And uh, Sharon... I think I think we should introduce you as one of the, the the main architects of bringing all this great comics programming to the Ann Arbor District Library, right? I mean, we just well, discovered yesterday that we've been working together for what five years now? At least five years. Yeah, it's been <laughs> it's been a great odyssey so far, and uh, we hope it expands considerably in the next few, few years. Can it keep expanding? We haven't hit critical mass yet? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we've been doing it with the Comic Book Academy for four years now, mm -hmm. and every year it's a new batch of kids. I mean, there's always a, like a couple, there's like five who like go from year to year and right. then eventually go off to college. Right, right. <laughs> they outgrow it. <laughs> But uh, for the most part, uh, it's it's a different. It's like twenty five new kids every time. Yeah. It's amazing. It was it was fun. We started with Comic Book Academy yesterday, and there were just so many new fresh faces, um, and so much excitement that uh, I'm I'm really wanting to see what they can come up with as the summer goes along. Yeah. So let's let's kick into the calendar. Let's talk about some of the things going on because yeah. we got the summer reading game is still in effect. Oh, absolutely. And uh, so that's at play.aadl.org. That's and, right. And uh, attending the Comic Book Academies and the Comics Fundamentals class, which we're going to talk about in a second, uh, actually earns you points towards cool prizes on there, right? Yep. Game codes, game codes. So, yeah, explain real quick what the summer game is, just in like a sentence or two. Um, the summer game involves, of course, reading, which we've always done, but also patrons can sign up online. They can... Um, get points for signing up for the traditional reading program and completing it, but they also can get game codes for coming to the library, um, to events, um, to visiting the different branches, to taking a good look at the website and contributing um, reviews and... Reviews, tagging tags, things. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all kinds of things. So there's just a whole um, endless wealth of opportunity for them to get codes and, and earn tons of points. Okay, so yes, play.adl.org is where you go to cash in. Right. And um, so we have a game code for today's uh, yes. episode, don't we? What yes, is we it? Do. I'll let I you announce it. I believe it is C A G 19 for your 19th episode. Yeah. Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to play.aadl.org today, uh, you can actually enter that code to get, uh, how many points do they get for that? Do you remember? I don't know. Oh, it could be a surprise. It will be, it, it will be the biggest thrill of their life, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but yes, yes. So for, yep. just for participating in this live episode, you get to enter that code. Or for watching this episode after the fact, you get to enter that right. code to add to your uh, point count to be able to get things like T-shirts, uh, silly putty. Uh, mugs. Mugs. Hats. Yeah. All sorts of cool things. Cash for prizes. Yes. Uh, or the, the old comic book thing. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, if you like sell grit, grit magazine, <laughs> and you could get you could get like an inflatable boat and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> all right, so let's go to the calendar. We've got July fifth. It was yesterday. Mm -hmm. We just started the Comic Book Academy, which is when and where. Um, comic Book Academy is each Tuesday now through July and first two weeks in August um, at Mallets Creek from one to three p.m. Mallets Creek is... Um, uh, Mallets Creek is... It's off Eisenhower in Ann Arbor. It is 3090 East Eisenhower. Wow, nicely done. <laughs> and so, yes, that is a, uh, a course for kids where you can learn uh, soup to nuts, how to make comics, and uh, we're, we've rejiggered it this year. We've uh, changed it a little bit this year to... Uh, so that each session you can just walk in and walk out of. We're, we encourage you to attend all six sessions, mm -hmm. but if you can, can't make it to some... No big deal. We've right. uh, we've uh, designed it so that each uh, class stands on its own, even though it contributes to a larger body of learning. And right. then it concludes at the end with a computer coloring course, right? Yep. We have a Comics Digital Coloring 101 session, and um, teens will be able to come in with their work. Um, if they have it scanned, great. If they don't, we'll be able to scan it here, and um, they'll get to do a lot of cleaning up of artwork and coloring and finishing basically awesome. 
Awesome. I mean, we usually do two sessions of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then today, starting tonight at 6 mm -hmm. p.m., we have the second year of Comics Fundamentals. Now, how is that any different than Comic Book Academy? Um, it's designed for a little older group, um, older teens, basically grades 9 through 12, and adults. And I think um, you bring to the instruction a little bit more sophistication in their thinking and, um, and in execution as well. So, yes, class for grown-ups, and that's mm -hmm. every Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Pittsfield branch. branch. And I don't remember what street that's off of. It's that... on Oak Valley, Drive, Oak Valley Drive, and I don't know the exact address. No, that's but... okay. It's over <laughs> It's over off of Ann Arbor Saline, over where the Target and Target Meyer is. Yeah. and Gretchen's <clears throat> house is across the street, and Ann Arbor Ice Cube next door. Yeah, there you go. You can't <laughs> miss it. Looks, it. It looks like a future building sitting yes, out there. Does. Yes, very <laughs> futuristic building. Okay, and then the neatest thing of all that I'm so excited about this year, after four years of doing this, is we've instituted a new thing this year where uh, my, my classes tend to be mostly about storytelling. Uh, mm -hmm. There's drawing instruction in there, but it's not deeply drawing instruction. Right. It's more about let, let's get in and learn how storytelling works in comics. But this year we've uh, sort of, uh, what am I trying to say, conscripted some local <laughs> cartoonists <laughs> to uh, lead some uh, additional drawing classes to right. work in conjunction with the academy and the fundamentals courses. So on July 9th, we've got Create and Draw. That, that's the Saturday, right? Yep, this Saturday. Uh, create and Draw Cartoony Characters with Denver Brubaker of the mm -hmm. checkeredman.com, mm -hmm. right? And that'll be at the Pittsfield branch from 1 to 3. Um, July 16th, I just did the blog for that. Today we'll have Janie Ho, um, who is a children's illustrator, but also has really delved into the comics world. And she will talk about creating anthropomorphic characters. Mm -hmm. Get your tongue around that one. Um, even in inanimate objects, um, bringing human qualities, of course, to human or inanimate right. objects. And that's July 16th at downtown from 1 to 2.30. Good memory. I'm, look, ah. I'm looking at a cheat sheet here. You're just doing this from the top of your head. Yeah, and then at the end of the month, July 30th, we have Chad Sell, who's going to, um, his program's called Get Real, and it's dealing with the realistic figure drawing. So kind of, kind of covering all the bases as much as possible. And Chad Sell is an amazing cartoonist who draws beautiful yes. characters. Uh, he's on DeviantArt, too. Look for him on uh, the DeviantArts. Just look for Chad Sell. Mm -hmm. uh, Janie Ho is at chickengirldesign.com. She draws the most adorable animals you've ever seen. <laughs> so you're learning from the best. And I'm just mm -hmm. so excited that we're able to work together to offer yeah. this really robust. I mean, it's like a school now. I mean, yeah. ADL is like going to art school. Right, like, right. How cool is that? So it is. I think I think everybody, I, I say this at every workshop we do together is that everybody should give you a round of applause for making this possible. <laughs> but I think that that's, that's true. You should be getting a round of applause everywhere yeah. you go for making all this stuff possible in Ann Arbor. So, okay, do, uh, did you bring a book to talk about oh, today? Did oh, I, rats, yes. you did. All right, I brought a book or two. Um, uh -huh. I brought along one called Saturn Apartments. Which, oh, it's upside down. Uh, oh, no, it's no, upside it down. No, it isn't upside down, but it looks like Can it you hold it up be. for the camera? Um, it is a book that there are now three volumes. The fourth has just started with the first segment online, and I cannot pronounce the author's name, but I know she's uh, quite talented. It's a kind of different manga where um, it's, it's much more subtle in its artwork, and the storyline is um, about a boy named Mitsu who is living on a ring literally around Earth. All of the people on Earth have gone ahead and evacuated so that earth can return to its original natural preserve but as a result of building this r giant ring containing apartments the um, structure has windows that need to be washed and so Mitsu who lives in the very lowest of the low levels um, has the rather daunting task of trying to um, learn the art of cleaning windows. He's just out of junior high. He's trying to make his way in the work world. He is an orphan. His father was also a window washer. And we don't know exactly what happened, but he disappeared while on a window washing mission. Oh my. Rope might have been cut might have broken, we don't know. But along Mitsu's journey, you find that he meets a lot of very fascinating people as he cleans their windows and looks into their world from the very wealthiest to the lowliest of the low. It looks like it has a kind of a sweet art style. It is It is um, kind of a gentler art style, um, but it, it really kind of delves into the, um, a lot of fascinating characters. Hmm. Yeah. So this is in the teen collection at AADL. Teen AADL. collection, yeah, yeah. So you can check it out today. 
Oh, absolutely. From uh, AADL. As soon as I Dotter. turn it in. <laughs> <laughs> we can go put it on hold at oh, AADL. Put it on hold, exactly. But, uh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, There's, I have one other, and, oh. then, and then I'll quit. I have, oh, a first, second book. So we always have to talk about first, second, because they're well, doing the yeah. most amazing stuff right now. Um, Brain Camp, kind of perfect for summer. Um, everybody, maybe in their experience, has gone to summer camp, and uh, this is no different, except it's a little bit with a twist. Jenna and Lucas, the two depicted on the cover, are losers in life <laughs> and have been recruited very quickly to join up with a summer camp already in session. This is the camp known as Camp Feeling, and um, they are going to find out that it is going to indeed turn them or the participants of the camp into brainiacs, if you will, but it might be at a particular cost. So it's kind of a wonderful mixture of horror and adventure and survival. And coming of age. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I read this yep. one. This is a, yep. this is an interesting book. Yep. Yes, and everything First Second does is usually great. So mm-hmm. yes, First Second Publishing put that out. Yep. Brain Camp by Susan Kim, Lawrence Clavan, and, and Faith, Faith Aaron, Aaron Hicks. Hicks. Yes, yep. everybody knows who, that, who she is. Mm-hmm. So, wow, thanks for those recommendations. Oh, now, sure. I'm going to turn to Carl for his recommendation. Uh, Sharon, you're not going to be able to hear him because you don't have headphones, and I don't know okay. where our other pair of headphones don't are. Don't worry. Okay. Don't worry. You'll just, you'll just smile and nod. I'll read his lips. Oh, okay, good. No. <laughs> <laughs> you librarians can do anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Carl, what do you got? Uh, my pick is Biomega, and uh, it's a manga book, and I sort of describe it as uh, Dark City meets Akira. Mm. And uh, it has a uh, talking bear with an AK-47. <laughs> so that, to me, was, like, worth the price of admission. And it's by one of my favorite artists. His name is uh, Sutsutomo Suits- Nihei, and he did the, the comic book Blame, which mm. is one of my favorites. So it's sort of this po- post-apocalyptic story. Uh, there's lots of uh, zombie creatures and wild, crazy stuff going on. And I wouldn't say it's all ages. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's teaming up. Uh, a kind of a teen kind of read, but it's one of my favorite comics right now. I think I believe they have five or six volumes out. You can get them at uh, most stores. Bear with machine gun sold me. You know. Yeah. But, so. Uh, me too. <laughs> okay, so who who what company put this out again? Uh, Viz did. Oh, okay. It's so a Viz, Viz Media, and uh, so you can find this at uh, your local comic store. Uh, if any librarians are listening, it's got uh, Carl's seal of approval, and as we've already established in this episode, Carl's a pretty smart guy, so listen to him. Uh, same with Sharon Iverson, who is has proven her mettle through five years of uh, building comic book programming uh, in the Ann Arbor area, so... Uh, you know what you're talking about when you read comics and when you talk about comics. So Brain Camp and then, what was it, Saturn? Saturn Apartments. Saturn Apartments. Okay, mm-hmm. well, we're going to get out of here. We ran long today, but that's because there was so much good stuff to talk about. So, um, yes, you can participate in the show live every week, every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at comicsagreat.tv. Uh, you can watch the episodes later on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash comicsagreat. It'll be available on aadl.org soon. Uh, don't forget to check all the great programming going on at ADL.org. The, the links to the the uh, events will be in the show notes. And, man, i got to thank you, Carl, for all of the crazy, thank awesome, you, smart you. talk you threw at us today. <laughs> really appreciate it. Uh, you, you are welcome back anytime. So now that I know I can get you at this time slot, you can expect to be uh, bugged by me a lot. So everybody should go awesome. to, to uh, <laughs> follow Comic Carl on the Twitters today, K-O-M-I-C-K-A-R-L. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to talk about beaming you in on Skype for one of our programs in the near future. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that, Sharon? That would be awesome. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to. That'd be great. So, uh, okay, cool. And uh, then what's, what website should people go to today to visit you? Uh, you can find me uh, on Comic Carl at DeviantArt. So, uh, that, that's, the main, that, that's, that's the main place to find, find what you're up to? Yeah, I updated a lot. Uh, you know, it's sort of a hub for I list a lot of the things I'm working on, and I'm always posting links and all that kind of stuff. And I and I and I rant on there from time to time. So <laughs> it's a good place to to hear all that stuff. Okay, cool. Well, we'll see you there. So thanks again, Carl. Thank you, Sharon, for Absolutely. coming on to the show. Good to see mm-hmm. you. Good to see uh, you. I'll see you tonight yes. at Comics Fundamentals. Mm-hmm. So. Until next week, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.